few years ago, I realized that I was thinking about things in a whole different way than I'd ever done all through my life. Things came up in my consciousness that I'd never known before, never really thought about. And as I looked at that, I realized that I had entered my elderhood. My name's Larry Grimm, and welcome to my show, Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. Uh, I am so pleased to be partners with Think Tank Hawaii. That gives me a chance to, to share with you some of the basic foundational understanding of, of, this, of this time of life, and which is a stage of life as well. We have a childhood, we have an adolescence, we have an adulthood, and I'm saying we have an elderhood. And when we look at elderhood, it gives us a chance to to uh, identify some of the tasks which need to be done. Perhaps you've saw, have seen the bumper sticker, aging is mandatory, maturing is optional. And what I wanna do in my coaching and in my work here is help people mature through their elderhood and make it a real and wonderful experience of life. I live here on, in Honolulu on Oahu and I've, for the past two years, have had the opportunity to serve as chaplain with Bristol Hospice Hawaii. Bristol Hospice lives its tagline, embracing a reverence for life. We seek to serve terminally ill patients and their families with the highest level of compassion and care and respect in their homes and in facilities across Oahu. So I'm here partly as that, but I'm also here with that experience, I mean, but I'm also here as one who does coaching personal life coaching. And I want to specify or focus on elderhood in my coaching because it is such a rich and wonderful time to integrate life and to make a whole, of, for each of us to look at it as a whole seamless cloth. So I want to help be a part of that for anyone who will use my coaching. You can always connect with me as a, as a personal life coach at Larry G at live-connections.com. We live in this island, uh, excuse me, the uh, five, five spiritual tasks that I'd like to briefly mention to you are uh, right here before you right now. I have found that both in my own experience internally and also in watching and, and working with other people, <clears throat> other elders throughout my life, in uh, chaplaincy work and long-term care and hospice care, that there seem to be these five tasks that are demanding or requiring, and uh, um, I like to say asking for our participation. The first is grieving. We grieve a lot more than we have been accustomed to because we've lost a lot more. The second is sorting out our stories. What are the stories that you listen to? And tell yourself about yourself. Those shape a great deal of who we, have been and who we are today, and who we will become in, through our elderhood. The third is forgiving. Now, I don't mean this as a, as a religious imperative. I mean that this seems to be some desire within us as human beings to, uh, in this elderhood time of life, to, to forgive and be forgiven, to experience that kind of love with one another. And then finally, the fifth one is letting go, and perhaps one of the most, oh, excuse me, the fourth one is preparing. We'll focus on that today with, uh, with Dr. Dexter Marr. Preparing externally in terms of getting finances, your free will, your li will, living will, preparations for all aspects of your elderhood life. All those are very important and to develop and strengthen your health in the elderhood and to lift up your life at that time. Uh, but there's also an internal preparation. What are the beliefs that you feel or that you have about your life and your life after life or the end of life? We dwell more on those, and those become very important for us in our elderhood and in our last days here. And then finally, letting go, which is perhaps the most challenging one that we do. My guest this morning is my teacher. I claim him as my teacher because... Here on Hawaii, when I arrived two years ago, I discovered that there was a mix of Buddhism that I had never known about and never really studied. And <clears throat> as a chaplain at Crystal Hospice, I was pleased to have an opportunity to meet Dexter Marr. Dexter Marr, Dr. Dexter Marr, is a lay minister with the 
the Hongji Shin Buddhist Temple on Pali Highway. And I, he just told me this morning he's also the president of the temple. Dexter, welcome. Thank you so much for coming to be a part of my, my show and to share what, uh, something about Buddhism for all of us, but also how do Buddhists prepare, something about how Buddhists go through this preparation for elderhood, for a rich elderhood, for a wonderful experience of li elderhood and end of life. Um, would you mind starting off with a self-introduction? Sure. First of all, I'd just like to thank you so much for the opportunity to join you in your show and, uh, um, and share you know, some of these yeah. Buddhist ideas you know, with your audience. You're welcome. Uh, as Larry said, I'm Dexter Marr. I'm a, uh, a lay minister with the Hongganji uh, uh, Buddhist Temple uh, and also the board president. Um, it's the big white temple on Pali Highway right near H1 that I, I'm sure many of you have uh, you know, driven past. I did grow up in uh, California, though, uh, as, and raised as a Methodist. Uh, and then I met my wife in college, and her family was uh, from this temple. Uh, and so I was exposed to Buddhism you know, through uh, her family. And, uh, the, uh, and we lived on the mainland. Uh, my, myself professionally in healthcare for uh, about 20 years before returning to Hawaii, uh, where we were able to then participate in um, the, the temple's um, uh, family and and uh, services. Just as a quick aside, uh, did you find that Methodism and Buddhism had some corollary uh, connections that you could enjoy? That some similarities? Um, well. Methodism is, you know, very kind of austere and and simple, you know, yes. as far as the uh, Christian yeah. religions go, and uh, yeah, so there were some uh, crossovers in terms of kind of style, especially yeah. with the uh, Hongganji uh, Shin Buddhist Temple here mm -hmm. in Hawaii, which uh, um, from its time in the uh, late night, well, uh, late 1800s. Um, began to adapt to Western styles. So it was one of the ah, first temples to have uh, pews and yeah. an organ yeah. and those uh, accommodations to uh, Western Christianity. And so actually when you look at our uh, temple uh, sanctuary space, uh, where the lay people are, it looks very much like a, a Methodist you know, type of uh, sanctuary. And the Dharma talk, the Dharma talk for the mm -hmm. day is like the sermon in the prison. Right. Yeah, exactly. In the Christian context. Right. Wonderful. So, yeah. One well, of the things that I was surprised about in being here, and I found so enriching for my life, mm -hmm. is a wide range of, of, uh, of Buddhist expressions. But I wonder if you would tell us, first of mm -hmm. all, just a, a little bit about a thumbnail sketch of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, well, Buddhism has endured for 2,600 <clears throat> years from its start in India um, in in present day, uh, the Nepal area near the Himalayas. Um, and it has many, many variations, you know, over that course of time. Um, maybe you can show me slide one. And the, um, the slide shows the, uh, the origins of the Buddhist uh, teachings with the Buddha himself 2,600 years ago. But then, uh, <clears throat> as the centuries moved on, there were major branches such as the Theravada, the Mahayana, and the Vajrana branches that developed. And uh, in Hawaii, the predominant uh, Buddhism is what we call Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, it's the type that uh, developed in Japan, and because of uh, Japanese immigration um, in the late 1800s, you know the, um, the followers you know came to Hawaii before. The priest did, and so, oh, of course. Uh, of course. and then other you know Japanese uh, Buddhist traditions you know followed. So the the, the major uh, type of Buddhism that we have in Hawaii uh, happens to be um, uh, this Mahayana uh, branch of I see. Uh, Buddhism. So on that slide, could you bring that slide up again, please? On that slide, the Buddha is center. Not mm -hmm. it doesn't move from left to right. Buddha is center. And then there are three main strands, the, 
that further mm -hmm. branch off into various expressions. Right, right. There, there is some geographic <coughs> range, the, that upper um, you know, right-hand side, the Theravada side, uh, is uh, you know, more predominant in Southeast Asia, and then the Vajrana side uh, is more in the uh, kind of China uh, area, and then the, and the Mahayana did move across China to Korea, to Japan, mm -hmm. in, and into the West. So, you know, there are uh, those uh, kind of characteristics. And as with every religion, Christianity included, Buddhism took on cultural orientations or oh, cultural absolutely. influences. Yeah. yeah, the um, kind of the modus operandi for Buddhism is to uh, you know coexist and synergize with ah. existing religions rather than to try to kind of uh, eradicate them mm -hmm. and and take over. And so. The uh, Buddhist principles or the philosophies you know, kind of uh, begin to blend, you know, with the uh, whatever the historic, you know, type of religion Very is. Good. And good. so um, in China, let's say, when it went there, it mixed with uh, Confucianism and Taoism. Ah. So there's many traditions and rituals that are actually Confucian or Taoist. Uh, so it's hard to tell sometimes within a culture, you know, what what is what. And in Japan, it was uh, Buddhism and Shintoism. Uh, here in the here in the West, it's beginning to be Buddhism and Christianity. Interesting. And the influences of things such as meditation, mm -hmm. um, you know, is being accepted in in churches and schools and in a predominantly Christian you know, society. Yeah, and, and much of Christianity, uh, Christian people seek meditation mm -hmm. and turn to the styles of meditation that have been practiced for centuries. Right, thousands of years. Thousands yes. of years in yeah. Asia. Exactly. So carry yeah. on, please. So if you show me the uh, slide number two, you know, these are the types of Buddhisms that are here currently in Hawaii. Um, on the far right-hand side are these Southeast Asian you know, types of uh, Buddhisms, and we have representatives of uh, monks from you know, those uh, paths um, all over the islands. And then on the other two columns, uh, starting with Zen and through the, the secular, uh, those are the uh, kind of more common uh, Mahayana type of, of Buddhisms. Uh, and the Tibetan is actually a Vajrana, but it's uh, uh, also. So there's many opportunities to explore Buddhism. You can you know, drive uh, you know, anywhere in Hawaii and run into some kind of a temple of some sort. Mm -hmm. um, and um, many times there'll be a, a Buddhist temple of some sort, although mm -hmm. even Christian churches look like Buddhist temples today. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. So the, uh, the, the core teachings you know, that the Buddha taught 2,600 mm -hmm. years ago are the one thing that are common to all of these different paths and traditions. Um, and so the... Uh, can you give us those name of the of the? Can you name those core teachings in a minute for us, uh, and then yeah, we'll come the back to further core explore teachings. Them? I can show in. Um, do we have a slide? Slide of three. That, of, I think it's slide. Uh, actually, slide five. Oh, slide five. Yeah. Right. We'll jump a little bit. Good. Slide five. Uh, the the core teachings of the Buddha himself <clears throat> were uh, anicca, dukkha, and anatta. You know the the words in the parentheses, and those uh, in a contemporary translation uh, have to do with uh, things are impermanent or change. You know constantly. Um, you know something that we're kind of used to. You know mm -hmm. in our you know kind of high tech you know type of, of world, but you know sometimes we can be uncomfortable with that. Yeah. Right. We're going to take a minute break and come back. Think Tech Hawaii is is leading us. Thank you so much your partnership. Come back in a minute. Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, 
integrated security technologies. Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Polo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all. Welcome back to Aging Gracefully into your elderhood and through your elderhood. This is, I'm Larry Grimm with Think Tech Hawaii partner, and we are exploring what it is to prepare for our elderhood, prepare for our end of life experience, and how our belief systems shape a lot of what we think and become, and how that in our elderhood becomes very important. But today is a special focus for that is Buddhism. And uh, Dexter Marr is with me, and I'm so grateful that he's here. He's, we've, we're going to return to his description of the three principles of Buddhism, and uh, let him th go, ask him to go a little bit deeper in onto those if he would like to do that. Okay, so welcome back. And uh, we were talking about these three cornerstones of the Buddhist teachings. These actually were developed uh, you know, through the, you know, the historical Buddha, who was a, an Indian prince, and he had a, an existential problem with, um, uh, although he was a king, you know, he would not be able to control things such as old age, sickness, and death. And so, you know, his realization was these principles that we're talking about, that, you know, things do change, you know, that, change. Uh, and that that's natural, and we shouldn't, you know, fear that. You know, and, uh, uh, and it gives us opportunities, you know, to, to make something that, that you're, we're in control of the change. Mm. Um, and then the challenge of life, you know, the, the dukkha part, is that, yes, you know, life does have these uh, things that hang over our heads, like old age, sickness, and death. But, you know, they can be uh, addressed, and we can you know, cope with them and live happily uh, with them. Has, has Buddhism, <clears throat> Buddhism, I remember being associated with suffering, is dukkha, that sense of, of life, the suffering, but not meant in the sense of, of uh, you got to go out and suffer all the time, but that it's challenged? Right. Yeah. Ah. yeah the more contemporary way <clears throat> of thinking of dukkha, you know, uh, is that it's a challenge, rather ah. than it's just, you know, life is suffering. You know, life is challenging, uh -huh. but you do have control, and you can uh, do something in order to uh, address, you know, what the, the problems are, whether it's old age, sickness, death, taxes, jobs, uh, relationship, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third principle, other cornerstone, is um, uh, this concept of connection. You know, anatta. Uh, it's not about yourself, right? It's about others and our connection, not only with other human beings, but with our world around us. You know, the world that is here to support us and to help make us uh, uh, successful and happy and uh, uh, a part of the amazing, you know, kind of ecosystem of, of life that we have. I like the I like the word system connection and system mm -hmm. to me are so so uh, importantly mm -hmm. to be held together right. because we can never see ourselves outside of the whole system of human right. relationships right. of ecosystem and we, we I've taught a lot about stewardship and I've really realized that stewardship has this idea that we control things that we're given charge of we can't do that mm -hmm. we That's we are that, part yeah. of it we are right. in in it which is a whole different approach from managing it. Yeah. What did the Buddha, I've heard stories about Buddha periodically, what did Buddha encounter when he, you, you just mm -hmm. mentioned he was a prince. Right. What were the challenges that he encountered? Well, the, uh, we can see um, um, slide number four. The, the, the Buddha, before he was the Buddha, was Siddhartha Gautama, a, an Indian prince. Uh, who had everything uh, 
uh, that one could you know, desire 2,600 years ago. That's um, the bottom right slide. Um, not exactly. No. But, you know, uh, but he was sheltered in his life, and he stayed within the castle walls mostly. But then he, he left uh, to explore you know, the, uh, the people mm -hmm. outside the castle, and, um, and he was shocked. You know, he, he saw sickness and old age and death for the first time. And, uh, and, and then he realized that you know, even as a king, he would not be able to avoid you know, these uh, conditions of life. You know? um, and so uh, he began a quest. You know, to, he left the, the temple or the, the castle. He left his family, and he went out to, uh, to find the way. And that was the, uh, the way of the monk that, that he had seen in that panel. Um, ah. and, and that resulted in him you know, coming up with these Buddhist principles. Oh, okay. But the, but the principles were to help him um, uh, figure out a way to uh, be happy, you know, even when the, the clouds of old age sickness and death uh, were hanging over him, and then he wanted to share that with others. And so that fits exactly into the topic of you know, how you know, these things can Perfectly. help the elderly, you know, in Perfectly. all the things that uh, we, we have to face. And then did, did meditation in particular play an important role in that, or the monastic mm -hmm. life, or what did he conclude? Well, one of the, uh, of the principal ways of, of the monks at that time were, was meditation. And he immediately started to uh, train with meditation masters, and he was able to um, you know, master those techniques, but he found that it didn't make him feel better. And so, he, you know, the, uh, although he was able to, to master the techniques, they weren't helpful for him. Uh, so he tried other things. He tried um, uh, severe ascetic practices, uh -huh. like starvation and long pilgrimages and, you know, the, the, that sort of thing. Walking on Lego blocks. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and he failed that too, you know, and, but he didn't give up, you know, and so uh, when he sat under the tree, you know, to figure things out, he wasn't really meditating. He was trying to ponder, you know, these, these mm -hmm. mysteries of, uh, of life. Interesting. And uh, search within himself, you know, the, uh, you know for, for the answers. Much like, you know, our, our uh, physicists do, our theoretical yeah. physicists, you know, it's just... Think it through. That's, you know, how do we solve this? Right. How to solve the problem? And he came up with those principles. And Bud, Buddha comes from the Hindu, uh, the Sanskrit word Buddha, mm -hmm. which means awake. Right. Yeah. So he he's the awakened the, one. The, right. Yeah. He was yeah. awakened to right. how how to do that in a middle way. I understand. Right. Between, right. Because he lived the rich life. Yeah. He tried this ascetic life. Yeah. And those didn't work. And so that's a lesson today because some of the many paths of Buddhism, you know, are one way or the other. Uh, but the middle way, you know, is, you know, the, uh, the Buddha's way. And the, and the three principles of connection, challenge, and change. Right, right. That really helps me. That simplifies, <laughs> mm -hmm. simplifies uh, Buddhism and the insights mm -hmm. <clears throat> that he gains uh, mm -hmm. so well. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that come into play with afterlife? Okay, with, with afterlife, actually, uh, the core teachings of the Buddha, uh, of, you know, the Siddhartha Gautama, uh, when asked, what happens after I die? He said, I don't know. I've never died. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, so the Buddha was very empirical. You know, he, he was not a metaphysical type of a, uh, teacher, uh, or, or his concepts weren't. Now, as Buddhism moves through all these different cultures, you know, it picked up a lot of afterlife you know, traditions and rituals of other uh, religions, and, and that sort of comes through at times. So, for instance, the Tibetans, you know, who believe as Buddhists in reincarnation, that reincarnation comes from their you know, pre-Buddhist uh, religion you oh. know, uh, you know, the, in Tibet. Uh -huh. um, but for uh, a path such as Hongganji, 
uh, Shinran Shonen, you know, the founder 800 mm -hmm. years ago of Honganji, he said, when I die, just throw my body into the river um, and let the fishes, you know, you know take yeah. care of me yeah. because, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, when I, you know, pass away, I am instantly free, you know, free of my human emotions and passions. Ah. Um, and so, you know, the... Uh, the Buddhist way of thinking is that it's not about your afterlife, you know, uh, but it's about <clears throat> your present life. So that's where the idea of being present I see. and focused Wake. on now yeah. you know, is, uh, is so important. Yeah. Be free from the suffering or free from the challenges mm -hmm. at the time of death, not knowing what that is exactly, right. except that yeah. there's... Well, you want to be at ease, at and ease. things... Uh, um, you know, in Buddhism, uh, for all these various uh, uh, conditions, is about being uh, understanding them and preparing. Ah, right? so it's so it's a movement of, in terms of hospice care. Right, um, exactly. It's from dis-ease mm -hmm. to ease. Right. right. What's the Pure Land? Uh, the Pure Land. The Pure Land is an ancient, you know, kind of a concept, and uh, if for some paths, Pure Land is nirvana or like a heavenly, you know, type of a place. Uh -huh. um, but in, uh, for Honganji, the Pure Land is actually now. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's an appreciation of the life that we have, you know, this precious moment, yeah. this instant uh -huh. in the universe that, uh -huh. we, that we have to be able to talk, talk. to one another <laughs> and share exactly. and, and love mm -hmm. and you know, appreciate a, a child's smile. You know, those are the, you know, the, the preciousness, you know, and there's no guarantees that, you know, you're going to get it again. So, you know, one should, uh, you know, live fully, you know, yeah. in the present and not, uh, okay. you know, you've been prepared for the fear of death and the fear of suffering, uh, sickness, and the fear of old age by doing those things that will uh, help you uh, understand the fear and then... Uh, Kind of try to tone that fear down, you know, those emotions that we have. Part of what elderhood is about for all of us, no matter what our background, but specifically we learn here from, from Buddhism, the importance of toning down, of getting prepared by letting go, by releasing, by toning down the fears and trusting in uh, the pure land we already taste. Or as the Christians would say, the reign and realm of God in this world, I mean in this world as well. They're all reunited. We're all really one. Thank you so much for being a part of this, Dexter. Thank you so my, much my for your, your thoughts and sharing so much. Uh, we'll be here in two weeks with uh, another presentation of Elderhood, Aging Gracefully. Thank you to Think Tech Kauai. Namaste.